This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. North and South by Elizabeth Clergon Gaskell. Read for LibriVox by Madame Tusk. www.rlowalrus.sitesled.com. Chapter 6 Farewell. Unwatched the garden bough shall sway, the tender blossoms flutter down. Unloved that beech will gather brown, the maple burn itself away. Unloved the sunflower, shining fair, ray round with flames her disk of seed, and many a rose carnation feed with summer spice the humming air. Till from the garden and the wild a fresh association blow, and year by year the landscape grow familiar to the strangest child. As year by year the labourer tills his wonted glebe or lops the glades, and year by year our memory fades from all the circle of the hills. Tennyson The last day came. The house was full of packing cases, which were being carted off at the front door to the nearest railway station. Even the pretty lawn at the side of the house was made unsightly and untidy by the straw that had been wafted upon it through the open door and windows. The rooms had a strange echoing sound in them, and the light came harshly and strongly in through the uncurtained windows, seeming already unfamiliar and strange. Mrs. Hale's dressing-room was left untouched to the last, and there she and Dixon were packing up clothes and interrupting each other every now and then to exclaim at and turn over with fond regard some forgotten treasure in the shape of some relic of the children while they were yet little. They did not make much progress with their work. Downstairs, Margaret stood calm and collected, ready to counsel or advise the men who had been called in to help the cook and Charlotte. These two last, crying between whiles, wondered how the young lady could keep up so this last day, and settled it between them that she was not likely to care much for Helston, having been so long in London. There she stood, very pale and quiet, with her large grey eyes observing everything, up to every present circumstance, however small. They could not understand how her heart was aching all the time, with a heavy pressure that no size could lift off or relieve, and how constant exertion of her perceptive faculties was the only way to keep herself from crying out with pain. Moreover, if she gave herself away, who was to act? Her father was examining papers, books, registers, what not, in the vestry with the clerk, and when he came in there were his own books to pack up, which no one but himself could do to his satisfaction. Besides, was Margaret one to give way before strange men, or even household friends like the cook and Charlotte? Not she. But at last the four packers went into the kitchen to their tea, and Margaret moved stiffly and slowly away from the place in the hall where she had been standing so long out through the bare, echoing drawing-room, into the twilight of the early November evening. There was a filmy veil of soft, dull mist, obscuring, but not hiding, all objects, giving them a lilac hue, for the sun had not yet fully set. A robin was singing, perhaps, Margaret thought, the very robin that her father had so often talked of as his winter pet, and for which he had made, with his own hands, a kind of robin-house by his study window. The leaves were more gorgeous than ever. The first touch of frost would lay them all low on the ground. Already one or two kept constantly floating down, amber and golden, in the low slanting sun-rays. Margaret went along the walk, under the pear-tree wall. She had never been along it since she paced it, at Henry Lennox's side. Here, at this bed of time, he began to speak of what she must not think of now. Her eyes were on that late blowing rose as she was trying to answer, and she had caught the idea of the vivid beauty of the feathery leaves of the carrots in the very middle of his last sentence. Only a fortnight ago, and all so changed. Where was he now? In London, going through the old round, dining with the old Harley Street set, or with the gayer young friends of his own? Even now, while she walked sadly through that damp, drear garden in the dusk, with everything falling and fading and turning to decay around her, he might be gladly putting away his law-books after a day of satisfactory toil, and freshening himself up, as he had told her he often did, by a run in the temple gardens, 
taking in the while the grand, inarticulate, mighty roar of tens of thousands of busy men, nigh at hand, but not seen, and catching ever at his quick turns glimpses of the lights of the city coming up out of the depths of the river. He had often spoken to Margaret of these hasty walks, snatched in the interval between study and dinner. At his best times, and in his best moods, had he spoken of them, and the thought of them had struck upon her fancy. Here there was no sound. The robin had gone away into the vast stillness of night. Now and then a cottage door in the distance was opened and shut, as if to admit the tired labourer to his home, but that sounded very far away. A stealthy, creeping, crunching sound among the crisp fallen leaves of the forest, beyond the garden, seemed almost close at hand. Margaret knew it was some poacher. Sitting up in her bedroom this past autumn, with the light of her candle extinguished, and purely revelling in the solemn beauty of the heavens and the earth, she had many a time seen the light, noiseless leap of the poachers over the garden fence, their quick tramp across the dewy moonlit lawn, their disappearances in the black, still shadow beyond. The wild, adventurous freedom of their life had taken her fancy. She felt inclined to wish them success. She had no fear of them. But to-night she was afraid. She knew not why. She heard Charlotte shutting the windows and fastening up for the night, unconscious that any one had gone out into the garden. A small branch, it might be of rotten wood, or it might be broken by force, came heavily down in the nearest part of the forest. Margaret ran, swift as Camilla, down to the window, and rapped at it with a hurried tremulousness which startled Charlotte within. "'Let me in! Let me in! It is only me, Charlotte!' Her heart did not steal its fluttering till she was safe in the drawing-room with the windows fastened and bolted, and the familiar walls hemming her round and shutting her in. She sat upon a packing-case, cheerless. Chill was the dreary and dismantled room. No fire, nor other light, but Charlotte's long, unsnuffed candle. Charlotte looked at Margaret with surprise, and Margaret, feeling it rather than seeing it, rose up. "'I was afraid you were shutting me out altogether, Charlotte.' said she, half-smiling, and then you would never have heard me in the kitchen, and the doors into the lane and churchyard are locked long ago. Oh, miss, I should have been sure to have missed you soon. The men would have wanted you to tell them how to go on, and I have put tea in Master's study as being the most comfortable room, so to speak. Thank you, Charlotte. You are a kind girl. I shall be sorry to leave you. You must try and write to me, if I can ever give you any little help or good advice. I shall always be glad to get a letter from Helston, you know. I shall be sure to send you my address when I know it. The study was all ready for tea. There was a good blazing fire and unlighted candles on the table. Margaret sat down on the rug, partly to warm herself, for the dampness of the evening hung about her dress, and over-fatigue had made her chilly. She kept herself balanced, by clasping her hands together around her knees, her head dropped a little towards her chest. The attitude was one of despondency whatever her frame of mind might be. But when she heard her father's step on the gravel outside, she started up, and hastily shaking her heavy black hair back, and wiping a few tears away that had come on her cheeks she knew not how, she went out to open the door for him. He showed far more depression than she did. She could hardly get him to talk, although she tried to speak on subjects that would interest him, at the cost of an effort every time, which she thought would be her last." "'Have you been a very long walk today? asked she, on seeing his refusal to touch food of any kind. "'As far as Fordham Beaches. I went to see Widow Maltby. She is sadly grieved at not having wished you good-bye. She says little Susan has kept watch down the lane for you for days past. "'Nay, Margaret, what is the matter, dear? The thought of the little child watching for her, and continually disappointed, from no forgetfulness on her part, but from sheer inability to leave home, was the last drop in poor Margaret's cup, and she was sobbing away as if her heart would break. Mr. Hale was distressingly perplexed. He rose and walked nervously up and down the room. Margaret tried to check herself, but would not speak until she could do so with firmness. She heard him talking as if to himself. "'I cannot bear it. I cannot bear to see the sufferings of others. I think I could go through my own with patience. Oh, is there no going back?' "'No, father,' said Margaret, looking straight at him, and speaking low and steadily. It is bad to believe you in error. It would be infinitely worse to have known you a hypocrite. She dropped her voice at the last few words, as if entertaining the idea of hypocrisy for a moment in connection with her father savoured of irreverence. Besides, she went on, 
"'It is only that I am tired to-night. "'I don't think that I am suffering from what you have done. "'Dear Papa, we can't either of us talk about it to-night. "'I believe,' said she, finding that tears and sobs would come in spite of herself. "'I had better go and take Mamma up this cup of tea. "'She had hers very early when I was too busy to go to her, "'and I am sure she would be glad of another now.' Railroad time inexorably wrenched them away from lovely, beloved Helston the next morning. They were gone. They had seen the last of the long, low parsonage home, half covered with china roses and purasanthus, more home-like than ever in the morning sun that glittered on its windows, each belonging to some well-loved room. Almost before they had settled themselves into the car, sent from Southampton to fetch them to the station, they were gone away to return no more. A sting at Margaret's heart made her strive to look out to catch the last glimpse of the old church tower at the turn where she knew it might be seen above a wave of the forest trees. But her father remembered this too, and she silently acknowledged his greater right to the one window from which it could be seen. She leant back and shut her eyes, and the tears welled forth and hung glittering for an instant on the shadowing eyelashes before rolling slowly down her cheeks and dropping unheeded on her dress. They were to stop in London, all night, at some quiet hotel. Poor Mrs. Hale had cried in her way nearly all day long, and Dixon showed her sorrow by extreme crossness, and a continual irritable attempt to keep her petticoats from even touching the unconscious Mr. Hale, whom she regarded as the origin of all this suffering. They went through the well-known streets, past houses which they had often visited, past shops in which she had lounged impatient by her aunt's side while that lady was making some important and interminable discussion, nay, absolutely past acquaintances in the streets, for though the morning had been of an incalculable length to them, and they felt as if it ought long ago to have closed in for the repose of darkness, it was the very busiest time of a London afternoon in November when they arrived there. It was long since Mrs. Hale had been in London, and she roused up, almost like a child, to look about her at the different streets, and to gaze after and exclaim at the shops and carriages. "'Oh, there's Harrison's, where I bought so many of my wedding things. Dear, how altered! They've got immense plate-glass windows, larger than Crawford's in Southampton. Oh, and there, I declare! No, it is not! Yes, it is! Margaret, we have just passed Mr. Henry Lennox. Where can he be going among all these shops?' Margaret started forwards, and as quickly fell back, half smiling at herself with a sudden motion. They were a hundred yards away by this time, but he seemed like a relic of Helston. He was associated with a bright morning and eventful day, and she should have liked to have seen him, without his seeing her, without the chance of their speaking. The evening, without employment, passed in a room high up in a hotel, it was long and heavy. Mr. Hale went out to his booksellers, and to call on a friend or two. Everyone they saw, either in the house or out in the streets, appeared hurrying to some appointment, expected by, or expecting, somebody. They alone seemed strange and friendless and desolate. Yet, within a mile, Margaret knew of house after house, where she, for her own sake, and her mother for her aunt Shaw's, would be welcomed, if they came in gladness, or even in peace of mind, if they came sorrowing and wanting sympathy in a complicated trouble like the present— then they would be felt as a shadow in all these houses of intimate acquaintances, not friends. London life is too whirling and full to admit of even an hour of that deep silence of feeling which the friends of Job showed when they sat with him on the ground seven days and seven nights, and none spake a word unto him, for they saw that his grief was very great. End of chapter 6